Hi everyone, my name is Ashna Sisodia and you're watching this session on Unacademy's YouTube channel Articulate. Today we are going to discuss why is China known as hydro hegemon? Hydro means water. So why do you think China is a water hegemon? Now to cover this First of all, one thing that we are going to discuss is the major issues that exist between India and China includes Brahmaputra dispute. So this particular session will also highlight the Brahmaputra dispute which exists between the two countries. So as you know, Asia is the largest continent in the world and Asia is the world's most water stressed continent as well which is a situation compounded by china's hydro supremacy why do you think china has taken control of tibet tibet is known as the rooftop of the world you know it has one of the world's largest glaciers in the world, world's largest glaciers, which is a source of many important river systems of South Asia and East Asia, as well as Southeast Asia. So that is why China is looked at as a hydro supremacy as a hydro hegemon. Beijing's recent decision to build a slew of new dams, giant dams, big dams on rivers that are flowing to other countries which has set to royal riparian relations. You know, China already boasts more large dams than the rest of the world put together. China has unveiled 635 billion dollars of fresh investment in water infrastructure over the next decade and it has by doing that emerged as the key obstacle to building institutionalized collaboration on shared water resources in asia you know to get a better perspective let me tell you one thing by controlling tibet china is an upstream country it shares more than 50 major international water courses with 14 downstream neighbors, including countries like India, Bhutan, Bangladesh. These are just few countries that I have named. There are a lot of other countries in Southeast Asia, particularly the Mekong River system, which is the lifeline of Southeast Asia. And when we look at the volume of water flowing out of China to other countries, that is 730 billion cubic meters, which is 30 times the volume which is flowing into China. Therefore, this is undoubtedly a strategic asset to China. The leadership of China while harnessing the rivers they have whenever they required, used them, used water rivers as a source of coercion and compliance you know china believes in marxist ideologies marxist philosopher political philosopher gramsci termed a mix of force and consent you know if you want to be a hegemon so not only force but a sort of uh, soft consent is also there which is not uncommon to hear that China is a hydro hegemon and based upon Mao Zedong policies also Mao also followed a realist approach an expansionist approach and this hydro policy is a part of it the water policy is a part of it so in contrast to the bilateral water treaties between many of its neighbors, China rejects the concept of water sharing arrangement. 
China rejects the rules-based management of common resources. For example, in rejecting the 1997 United Nations Convention, which is responsible for laying down rules on shared water resources, China asserted its claim that an upstream power, that is the upper riparian state, has the right to assert absolute territorial sovereignty over the waters on its sides of international boundary. Or the, they have the right to divert as much as water that they wishes they wish for its need, irrespective of the effect that it will have on downriver state, on a low riparian state. So if you look at the map, let me show you that. You will see that China is upper riparian state, right? And India is a lower riparian state. This is Yarlung Sagpo River. So India is a lower riparian state. So keeping that in mind, we get to know that China always asserts this and China has at many times rejected the United Nations conventions. And today, by building mega dams and reservoirs in its borderlands, China is working to re-engineer the flows of major rivers that are the lifeline of lower riparian states. China is the source of transboundary river flows to the largest number of countries in the world. From Russia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan to the states in the Indochina Peninsula and Southern Asia, South Asia. This preeminence resulted from its absorption of ethnic minority homelands that now makes up 60% of its landmass and are the origin of all the international rivers flowing out of Chinese held territory. No other country in the world comes close to the hydro hegemony that China has established. And since the last decade, China's dam building has been moving from dam saturated internal rivers to international rivers. And most of the new mega projects that have been announced by China, their priority ventures are concentrated in China's seismically active southwest region, which is largely populated by ethnic minorities. So such dam building is triggering new ethnic tensions over displacement as well as submergence of those areas. But the State Council has approved new dams on River Salvin, Brahmaputra and Mekong rivers, which originated on the Tibetan Plateau and which flows to South Asia and Southeast Asia. So the unveiling of these projects on the Brahmaputra has recently evoked Indian diplomatic concerns. This comes at a time when water has emerged as new Chinese-Indian divide. Whereas the Salvin projects and the suspension of dam building on that river, which was announced eight years ago. China already has a significant financial trade and political leverage over most of its neighbors. But now by building and, you know, these dams, it is going to have an asymmetric control over cross border flows. So it is seeking to have its hand on Asia's water tap. Given the point in mind that climate change is happening, so water scarcity is going to be an important issue. Future wars are going to be water wars. So given China's unique riparian position and its role, it will not be possible to transform the Asian water competition into cooperation without China playing a leadership role to develop a rules-based system. So whenever you are quoting these things in your answer, specifically with respect to the Brahmaputra dispute or the hydro hegemony of China, I think you have to quote this person also, that is Brahma Chalani. Brahma Chalani is the author of a book named as Water, Asia's New Battleground. And 
Another book is Water, Peace and War, Confronting the Global Water Crisis. He writes a lot of expert commentaries on water disputes in Asia. So, like I said, that China's upstream position is a reality. We cannot ignore that. But its dominance on the Brahmaputra is overstated. There are people, those who say that it is time to de-emphasize China's hydro hegemony. We have to pursue a more meaningful water dialogue on hydrological data sharing that is essential. But India would equally require building a lower riparian coalition with like-minded countries that are affected by this decision like Bhutan and Bangladesh on the Brahmaputra issue. Do you know that every year annually India is paying 82 lakh rupees to China to just get this hydrological data of Brahmaputra river. Whereas when it comes to Bangladesh, this hydrological data is provided to Bangladesh free of cost, free of cost. So there is a presence of complex interdependence relationship between India and China. We should not forget that, that the relationship is complexly interdependent. Some say that despite India being a lower riparian state on the Brahmaputra, it is not completely in a disadvantageous situation. Since 56% of Yarlung Sangpo, also known as Brahmaputra in India, it flows in the Chinese territory, one can be easily mistaken into believing that China controls a large share of the water. But China has a legacy of controlling rivers. It has a history of hydraulic engineering. You know, even when Ma Zedong established the People's Republic of China in 1949, he issued directives to harness rivers and he viewed Tibet as a water tower. That is why, you know, right after winning the civil war, when he came to power, when he became the president of China, he started expanding, taking control of Tibet because Tibet is seen as a water tower. And as Mao Zedong set out, you know, about transforming China into a modern industrialized socialist state, he used to say that nature is an enemy that had to be beaten, which means he re realized it, that rivers, he was symbolizing rivers as, you know, a means to political supremacy. And today, China has a powerful hydraulic bureaucracy with large investments in the hydropower sector, in mega dams and water diversion projects. However, the volumetric potential of this river is not proportional to its length inside China. Volume-wise, it is not much. Yarlung Sangpo is a trans-Himalayan river where the annual precipitation, as the studies have revealed, it is about 300 mm and once it crosses the Himalayan crest line the annual rainfall is about 2000 to 2100 mm which means that when the Yarlum Sangpo reaches India it swells because of the monsoon rain and also the contribution of the tributaries like Lohit, Dibang and Diang. So data has suggested that both during the lean and the peak flow, the total annual outflow of Yarlung Sangpo from China is less than that from the Brahmaputra. This means that India has ample water on its side to harness. But still, you know, we know the history of China. We know that an upper riparian state like China, what it can do, so there has to be some mechanism where we can interact on a regular basis with the Chinese authority. We can work out on an agreement, a water agreement. Because in case of a dispute, in case of a conflict, 
it can have a lot of impact on the lives of indian people specifically the northeastern people so keeping that in mind let us try to discuss a little brahmaputra dispute we'll try to understand the geographical aspects we'll try to understand the importance of river to india the importance of brahmaputra to china and what is the conflict about and whether we have signed any agreement or not and what are the problems with the agreement and what will be the impact of the plan and india's options so what does the plan aim to do china actually has approved in its uh, 14th five year plan from 2021 to 2025 it has approved a number of strategic projects to be pursued as on priority the major projects of concern for india includes the first dam in tibet on the lower reaches of yarlung zangpo in this project china could build up up to 60 gigawatt of generation capacity on the river which would make it the world's biggest hydropower project which can overtake china's earlier three gorges dam also another major of cons- uh, cause of concern is uh, sichuan tibet railway line which is near the indian border and a push for self sufficiency in emerging industries such as ai these are the major concerns and in that water is the top priority water dispute the dam building the construction of these several dams along this river on the chinese side it has become a repeated cause of concern we know that india and china they continue to grow demographically as well as economically and increased consumption among its citizenry both nations face water constraints and in a race to develop new projects in order to overcome them but why do you think water issue is so important because i told you earlier india is facing water disputes not only among its states but also with its neighboring countries so water is a politically contested issue today it is a politically contested issue in much of south asia the region is facing water shortage and agrarian difficulties and it will continue to face increasing demands on energy and water with rapid industrialization over extraction of ground water is of particular concern in india bangladesh nepal and countries like pakistan moreover salinity and arsenic contamination has also affected 60% of ground water in indo gangetic plain so when you combine these factors together the impact of climate change along with it that's uh, reducing the amount of water in brahmaputra basin and changing the patterns of water flow and under such circumstances the increasing need for power and stable water levels it could prompt reconsideration in bilateral water sharing treaties and china's efforts to promote indigenous innovation have failed in the past and they are unlikely to be successful in the future so the new five year plan in china calls for a move towards less dependence on the outside world for advanced technology as well as you know a source of final demand so following the socialist road is incompatible with increasing the share of household consumption in chinese gdp geographically if we uh, you know look at uh, this river brahmaputra like i said earlier over 56% of this river flows in chinese territory but volume wise volume wise it is less because data has suggested annual outflow of this river is less than that of india's brahmaputra so the brahmaputra gets mightier as it flows downstream because of the flow contribution of the tributaries and in terms of sediment flow the flow volume and discharge is not sufficient to generate and transport the large sediment bloat that is characteristic of this brahmaputra downstream so china completed zangmu dam with this much capacity built on the upper reaches of brahmaputra in 
and three more dams at Dagu and Jiacha and Zeshu. These are currently under construction. The work on Zam Hydropower Station, which will be the largest, you know, two commenced, it started in 2015. Why do you think this river is important to China? Because of its unique position as the only country in the region which is completely upper riparian, which gives China an unparalleled advantage and power to influence the flow of water to nations downstream. You know, China has been historically a water scarce country with uneven distribution of its power water resources. And this inter-regional disparity in water resources is stuck but it has undertaken gigantic water diversion projects. One of them is South North Water Transfer Project to address its regional water distribution imbalance. And this river is a source of drinking water and agriculture for the Tibetan areas. You know, Chinese perspective is that because it is home to close to 20% of the world's population, but it has only 7% of its water resources. So it faces severe pollution also, which is caused by rapid industrialization. Its southern regions are water rich in comparison to the northern part of China. So to solve that, it plans to link the major rivers through canals. And for that, China has been blocking rivers like Mekong and its tributaries which has been affecting Southeast Asian countries like Thailand, Vietnam, Laos and Cambodia. So China, being an upper riparian state in Asia, sees these projects as a continuation of its historic tributary system. And the smaller states have no means of effectively resisting China. They don't have any sort of significant leverage in negotiation with China. And in the Himalayas, there are multiple operational dams in Yarlung Sangpo Basin with more dams commissioned and under construction, which can pose a threat to Indian side. India has 17% of the world's population, but 4% of water resources. India is severely water stressed. And in summer, a vast majority of urban areas face water shortage. And most of India's population reside in Gangetic Plains, which enjoy water throughout the year but the southern and western regions experience harsh and dry summer and the rainfall is also scarce and erratic as a result of which there was an ambitious project that was announced north south link river linking project but that was also criticized for potentially disturbing the fragile ecosystem but china seems to have chosen a policy of absolute sovereignty rather than one of national integrity over shared water resources. So any forward movement on ensuring hydro security in this basin, we need to have a long uh, understanding, long term understanding with them. So there's no doubt that India's hydro diplomacy faces the daunting challenge of engaging China in a sustained continuous dialogue and securing a water sharing treaty which serves the interest of both the countries. So there have been suggestions that if necessary, international community should also be involved. So Brahmaputra conflict or dispute is all about the type of projects that are introduced by China. So there's a fear of diversion. These projects are runoff river projects where uh, as per China, water will be returned to the river after using it for electricity generation, hydropower generation. But people say that this can result into hoarding. They may release the water, you know, uh, at such a point or they, the volume of water that is released can be high also, which can destroy, you know, some um, cities in the northeastern region. These dams are large enough to be converted and used as storage dams, especially if the purpose is flood control and irrigation. So in the absence of water treaty, China depriving India of water during lean seasons can become a possibility. Also, it can result into flooding. And these are the dams that are built in high seismic 
zones in a very volatile tectonic zone so there is seismic instability also and then there is pollution in building its dams china has also polluted its river so you know it has effect on farming also because the newest dams have been uh, you know envisaged by china on lower reaches of the brahmaputra river and by building dams especially near the great bend which is arunachal pradesh in that region china could be seeking to leverage its position over the indian state of arunachal pradesh so they may use a principle of prior appropriation to influence arunachal pradesh so what are do you think the water issues of china because of water resource constraints there is uh, rapid industrialization pollution has happened and regional imbalance within china that is one of the reason river interlinking plans are there these are very ambitious projects and international ramifications china being an upper riparian state has been blocking rivers like mekong and its tributaries so it has rejected the united nation convention on that also so it uses water as a geopolitical tool and it reflects a hegemonic attitude china's projects in the himalayas have recently begun to operate china sees such projects as a continuation of its historic tributary system so is there any agreement that we have signed the answer is no as of now there is no institutionalized mechanism on water cooperation between india and china china has signed no such treaty with india or any of its neighbors china has refused to ratify this convention so what can be done india needs to have more water development footprint in the northeast particularly in arunachal pradesh what else can be done to india can enhance economic growth in the northeastern region it needs to build water storages we need to give uh, you know exert prior downstream riparian appropriation rights india's water storage capacity is less than 250 million cubic meters which is actually pitable as compared to china it is very small it is very pitty it must be also not forgotten forgotten that china's claim to arunachal pradesh territory is also a claim to the vast amount of water which is flowing in this area we should not forget it however hydro projects in arunachal pradesh have to be framed in a consultative manner with wider stakeholder and interprovincial participation in the northeast particularly i'm talking about assam which is downstream to arunachal pradesh in order to avoid any interstate water conflict and equally significant are the potential waterways and navigation in northeast i think with the national democratic alliance government's investment in uh, inland waterway the um, you know brahmaputra national waterway 2 I think it will act as a critical economic corridor with direct access to Chittagong port in Bangladesh and Haldia port in West Bengal and this can boost trade with Southeast Asian countries. So we know that everyday policy concerns like water sharing and their usage receive less attention but when combined with larger security concerns I think they are dealt with only uh, when uh, natural disasters occur. yet water politics has far reaching consequences when it comes to prosperity and security of countries so through some critical debates on these agreements and maybe by active participation of regional organization and mutual understanding among shareholders these issues could be addressed so hydro diplomacy in uh, south asia could start with less sensitive areas like first we can engage with each other in managing flooding by sharing forecasting data by collaborating on navigation electricity generation and water quality and if we are successful in these non political areas or less political areas 
then these types of less formal cooperation might eventually make countries more willing to consider an official multilateral forum which could help them in building trust and resolve grievances or disputes and also managing shared waterways. So we are done with this particular topic. This is it for this session. Thank you very much. And by the way, you can access full-fledged political science and international relation optional course on Unacademy Plus. My code is Ashna Sisodia. If you are planning to take subscription on Unacademy, this is the code that you can use to get your subscription. And if you are using my code, you will also get personalized mentorship free of cost. This is it. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Take care.